Yeah, I mean, it's pretty close. He's M7.5-ish. Um, this would be a good time, actually, if we had the HUD to sort of have a look and see his 3-betting and opening frequencies. If he's the sort of guy that opens, like, 15 or 16 from early, uh, you know, 25 to 28 from mid and, like, 45 from late and 3-bets at, like, 8 or 10%, it's probably an easy call. If he's a guy that has those same stack, uh, stats, respectively, like, uh, you know, like, 8, 14, 22, and 3, then it's a fold. Uh, but I think default, it's probably a call. Uh, and only time will tell, uh, you know, when the stats do pop up, uh, if we could have escaped. Um, but I, I do think he's going to jam in that instance, probably, you know, all pairs, uh, probably worse suited aces, probably ace eight and ace nine, uh, in general, as a default, guys, probably. Well, it's getting close at that point, uh, and king queen, king jack suited, king ten suited, hands like that. So, I think in a, you know it's it's okay. And again, I think this guy's three five six probably got around the same range. Uh, and again, we just have to call it off. And I think both times, see if we can get a split here, king. Thank you. <laughs> so I think both times. Uh, I mean, obviously we were kind of unlucky both times. We were crushed, but. Um, I think first time, you know, you could have rolled like fours, and then second time you could have rolled like, you know, king, queen, flips, or you know, whatever. Most of the time, I think we're going to have a pretty good price. Uh, so they're just chipping away at us. We won the big pot, and now these guys are just, just clawing at us. And the eights again, I mean, if this guy three, four, five, six, seven had a jam there, <laughs> it would have been pretty close. That's actually a really good instant, uh, good uh, situation for us. Uh, it's hard to imagine this guy's smart enough. Uh, I've got him marked as a fish to have like called there with a big hand to trap and hoping one of these short stacks jam. So he's probably just going to fold his king jack or whatever, or he might just be in a gambling mood. And again, we see kind of <laughs> just the top of someone's range. And these guys are just relentlessly chipping away at us, aren't they? Um, he could have had, I think, again, he may, may even, I mean, with that stack depth he had, he could have even had, like, a four suited and stuff, but, uh, just trying to make it as tough for us as possible, which is good, five, six, I like it, tough. I think I'm just going to jam there, uh, it is profitable to do so, not super profitable, like, it's a pin of ten. For 8-7 off, he's got M7, which, you know, does make me think twice about it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, yeah, I mean, raising to fold is okay. Uh, it's a little bit gross, though, when you raise fold a hand that you could have jammed with a few PN up your sleeve. You know, and I normally j uh, use PN, as you know, with a, like, a, I like to have a 10% buffer. Uh, and so... You know, if it's a, a PN of, uh, in that instance, uh, you know, we had a PN of 10, so uh, I'd like to have, well, we needed a PN of 7, so I'd like to have 7.7, 7, like a 10% extra, 7.7 ish, so closer to 8. Uh, I mean, that's obviously still cutting it fine, but just sort of as a general, as a general guideline, that's sort of how I think about it. I like to have an extra 10% up my sleeve. So if I needed a pan of, uh, you know, 20, I'd like to have 22 at least. Just so that we're not jamming too close to break even. Uh, and I think that's pretty obvious. I mean, if that guy had have had M10 there, five, six, I think I will try and steal again here. If that guy had have had M10, I wasn't going to jam, obviously. Uh, but he only had effective M7. And so it was just getting down to that stack size where I think it was pretty close. Um, where we can, we have options to limp, uh, raise fold, uh, or just jam. Uh, I went kind of, I guess, for the, the more aggressive option, which is just to gram it in. Uh, it's it's uh, more aggressive slash reckless uh, because it is, you know, we have a little bit depth of stack. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, it's only M7 effectively. We're heads up. It's just a profitable, it's just profitable shove in there with that hand. So I just went and kept it simple, you know. The other thing is, too, is that uh, we could always raise and he just flats. And now he gets to call with a hand that's, you know, we have a hand that's uh, not really that good 
you know, he can fight maybe with like a uh, a queen eight suited or something, uh, right? With hands all hands that he's going to fold with if we just jam on him. Um, so that's always a consideration as well, is that he gets to call now and play correctly in position with a lot of hands. Uh, and so, bottom right, I probably should have seabird here. Uh, yeah, it's pretty close. And then he just pots turn. So I think at that point, I don't mind just giving it up. <clears throat> I, I think if he had a bet small turn, I probably would have called and then see what he did on the river. Um, but uh, once he just smashes pot, uh, even if he is bluffing, like, he just has to be bluffing more often for us to be able to call because, uh, we're not getting very good pot odds. And I just don't think, I don't think he has that many bluffs that just pot, that just smash turn like that. Uh, I mean, I'm just, we don't really know anything about the guy, so obviously it's kind of hard to say, but just speaking generally. I don't think that many guys in that situation just smash pot turn as a bluff. Uh, I think most guys, if they're going to bluff turn, just bet sort of a normal half pot amount. 7, 14, 21. 4 is 18. That's pretty close. I mean, you could definitely jam that at M3.5, but uh, I'm going to play kind of a Hel Helmuth style here. Uh, and fold and uh, fold right down to a tiny stack. Uh, which is something that Helmuth used to get criticised a lot for. Uh, but I think these days players are more acceptant. They accept that more. Uh, back in the Dan Harrington biggerish days, Dan Harrington is a, a player who's uh, got some very good books, especially for newish players uh, on tournament poker. A series. Uh, there's the early stage one, then there's, I think it's the blue one, and then there's a the red endgame one, and then there's the grey workbook where he talks about different situations. Uh, his style is just a little bit outdated. Uh, but at the same time, there's still a lot of, you know, useful information in there and some good strategy and stuff that gets you thinking. And, uh, his old style, the vigorish, uh, if you haven't seen any of my other videos, um, that's the term that he uses for just jamming first in. The power of that play is that, hey, even if you jam first in with two seven off, you might win at showdown if you do get called. Uh, but the second, you know, power play pup powerful part of that play is that everyone can fold. So you have two ways of winning the pot, sh at showdown or with everyone folding. Uh, and he used to really abuse that and the fact that players used to play far too tightly against all-ins. They used to perceive it as a lot stronger than it was and they'd fold, you know, back in the day, you know, an M3.5 all-in or four all-in from mid and guys behind are folding, you know, like ace 10 and stuff, uh, you know, and the, from the small blind because they think, oh, he's all in, he must have a strong hand. Um, that's sort of gone out the window these days because players are a lot more aware of, uh, you know, correct correct ranges to be jamming with and uh, when players are jamming at certain stack sizes, calling with a closer to optimal range. And so the whole idea of the vigorish, which was just sort of M5 and under, just pretty much jamming all in with first in with anything, uh that Dan Harrington used to do is kind of out the window and players are playing a closer to Nash equilibrium game now, uh, which means jamming more correctly. And so when you're talking about a Nash equilibrium or GTO sort of situation when you're short stacked, Queen 9 here first in from this position would be a jam, but from UTG uh, it might not be um, and that sort of thing. But uh, in the old days they just used to jam it regardless. Uh, I'm uh, just going to fold the king five there, I think. So we got through that uh, bottom middle with the one rebuy, one out on the 33. We're doing okay in that. We've set ourselves up with a decent stack. And this top middle one. Yeah, I mean, we're short, but we're getting a little bit deep now. We can take this one with three players behind. Uh, 
I'm going to fold the King Queen top right. Uh, I don't think M9 UTG just shove. I mean, it is a rebuy. He could be perhaps wide and just say, hey, I'm going to shove here, try and get some chips for. Wow, well, it got through top middle. That's that's a bonus. Really uh, kind of surprised that got through. Uh, so bottom middle, I think I'm going to bet again here and uh, make up my mind river. I do think sometimes he has hands like nines and stuff and, and tens that we might be able to get to fold. Uh, at the same time, we could sometimes have the best hand. He could have spades. So at this point, I'd say he's probably not going to fold. If he's got ace-eight, we could probably, or an eight, we could probably fold that out, eight-nine, I think. Uh, but we're just going to probably have to check now and just hope that he's got, you know, like 10 jack of spades. Uh, but a lot of the time here, I think he's got king, queen, king, jack, and he's just obviously not folding that. Um, if we wanted to go ultra psycho, we could just shove and try and fold out like that hand. I think if we shove, he has a hard time calling with it. Uh, but I don't know anything about him. I mean, he could just be, he could just be an epic whale. Uh, I mean, his stats don't say that. He looks kind of solid from his stats. Uh, he looks very solid. So, um, you know, which, yeah, I mean, a solid player might fold in that spot if we just shove river because it looks like we've got aces or ace-king or flopped or, you know, somehow ended up with two pair of sets. Uh, and his hand is pretty face up, in my opinion, as, as that sort of... Uh, I mean, it look, that's what it looked like he had, you know, king... I said most of the time he's got king-queen, king-jack. You don't have to be a... Um, a, a rocket scientist, a brain surgeon, or you know, a NASCAR driver to figure that out. Uh, I think it just just looked like he was check calling the showdown value. Um, he's opened and then called a three bet out of position. He seems kind of solid. So the hands that are going to do that are going to be probably king ten suited and king jack up. Um, obviously, once in a while, I guess it's not impossible that he, he flopped a you know a set and he's just checking to less barrel. Uh, I mean, it's not too bad a play, I think, to do that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, most of his combinations, most of his range is made up of top pair combos. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, that is what he had. Yeah, it would have been interesting if we just shove River to, to try and fold out that hand. Uh, he may even just... I mean, it's not impossible, too, that he calls with Ace-King because he just doesn't want to 4-bet and then potentially deal with a 5-bet, you know, or 4-bet and get called out of position and then have to know and then be sort of in a tr tricky spot post-flop when he's trying to work out what to do with his uh, with his ace-king high out of position on like a jack-9-5 board. Uh, I think I'm just going to shove this right. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. Well... seventeen. Yeah. It's pretty close. Uh, in this instance, what I was talking about before about break evens, uh, this is pretty close to, to sort of. I mean, we're only M two and a half. Uh, there's twelve in there, and we have thirty, so there's two and a half exactly M, and that means we've got uh, like five, ten, fifteen, seventeen and a half, and Queen ten only has a PN of seventeen. Um, so in this instance, you know, it is close, but at the same time. We're only M two and a half, you know, so it's like, even though now, you know, I like to have, I was just saying before about I like to have the M, uh, the 10% buffer, uh, of PN. I just think that at that stack depth, uh, we're just getting too short because what the PN doesn't account for is sort of, uh, the position you're in. And in that instance from early position, the blinds are going to pass by in a moment. And uh, they're going to really cripple us, you know, because we're going to lose almost like a third of our stack just from the blinds and annies coming past. So uh, we just kind of have to just roll with it. Uh, it's kind of like a best of a bad situation sort of thing. We're probably not really going to get a better jam than that. 
Uh, and so we're just going to have to take it. Uh, if we get lucky, you know, we can go back up to M sort of five or six. Uh, and uh, as it was, obviously, we were crushed and in bad shape, but that's the way it goes sometimes. So, bottom right here, uh, we managed to get some chips, chippies, and let's bring in, uh, what about this one here? So I think I will just raise this one here. Uh, this guy's pretty loose. Uh, we're getting a bit more information on him here and, uh, yeah, I mean, he's folding to a decent percentage of three bets. He's opening wide, 55% stealing, so he's kind of an ideal guy to attack there. 24, 6, 30. Uh, this one we can't quite fold. Pretty easy call, really. And we just get there on the river. River rat. I was calling that one too early. I tried to say we, we didn't get there, we lost before the river came out and uh, I kind of, uh, I really played the poker gods there, didn't I? I kind of, um, it's a bit of multi-level thinking, you know. I knew if I said that they'd kind of be disgusted, like how dare you try to predict the outcome in poker before we decide what's going to happen. We're going to give you a nine now. Uh, and that's kind of, they fell right into my, my trap really because that's what I was, what I was hoping was, was going to happen. Um, they work in mysterious ways. Hmm. Yeah, it's actually not a bad stack, this top middle one here, with two of... two of 629. It's a nice feeling when you hold up, isn't it? Um, but uh, it just doesn't... Uh, happen often enough, unfortunately. And uh, that's why the essence of you know, poker is aggression. And, uh, you know, we haven't been running good in December. Uh, we've been running pretty bad, so way above, uh, below EV. So uh, I think, you know, that that's just part of the game, the variance. But, uh, yeah, I mean, as you've heard me talk about, as you've heard me say before, uh, you got to try and control your own, your own fate. As best you can, and you know, bottom middle, the the three bet with four eight suited, you know, again, that's the sort of thing. Like, okay, who's who's three betting that hand? Because in my opinion, that was just a golden spot. I mean, it's like raising first in with ace king. You know, it's like obvious. Uh, but uh, a lot of players, I think, would miss that. Uh, I think this one here, certainly not a fist pump, but he's uh, only around M sort of eleven, and uh, it's a typical sort of re steal. And we have Ace Jack, so I mean, if he's got Ace Queen or whatever, it's good on him. But I think between him calling now with Ace Ten or like pocket sixes, or him just folding like a high percentage of the time, uh, it's pretty profitable for us to shove in there. So I think I will. Did that guy limp? No, no, he raised. I'm just trying to work out what the hell will happen here. I kind of just zoned out for a minute. But I, in any case, I think I'm going to call with the King Queen flop top pair and stack off. Sounds like a plan. <laughs> so, it's a little bit scary here because uh, he's got. We don't have four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We don't have tons of stats on him, but uh, well, it's kind of close here. Uh, I think. I think if he's got eights to jacks, he's just going to check shove a lot of the time. I'm just going to bet small. If he's got like aces and he's being super tricky, then it's just. I mean, we're probably going to stack off anyway, right? So. Uh, I might have a hard time folding this top left one. Well, the, the annoying thing about this hand, the annoying thing about this hand bottom left, uh, is that uh, I don't think we can fold up here now. We've just priced ourselves in, haven't we? Have we? Uh, is that he's actually given us kind of an escape path? You know, if he does have aces or ace queen, he actually has given us the escape path, which is really annoying. But he just folds like a champ. Uh, played it like a champ. Uh, so, wow, I, I've just played this one. I've made a, I've really made a mess of this one up here. I think better play would have been to check flop. 
and maybe check jam. I think we might actually have almost priced ourselves into this. Let's think about this. It's like six and a half to call. And it's going to be like, we're getting like 133. We have 24% of our outs alive. Sometimes you could have ace three or ace four. Sometimes you could have ace 10 and just have spazzed out king queen. You could have like eight, nine of clubs. Yeah, I think blind versus blind. I think we're getting close to the right price here, actually, now that we've, we've played it this way. And we are actually ahead, so. And that, my friends, is a pretty sick hold. Pay the man! Uh, yeah, that was, um... I was just one of those hands. It was, it was just... I mean, we kind of played it a bit messy, but... Messy is as messy does, whatever that means. Uh, we just had to uh, make our decision uh, based on the moment that we got ourselves into. You know, we took that line where we uh, played the uh, ace jack aggressively through betting pre. Uh, not really that aggressively, blind on blind M10. I think he's going to shove, well, it was slightly under, I think we had 9.5 or so. I think he's just going to shove a lot of worse aces, pairs, king queens, and stuff pre flop. I think he's going to over. Uh, I think he's going to call uh, too too frequently as well with a lot of you know trashy hands just because that's what players players do blind versus blind. They you know they're like who do you think you are? You know you're raising me. You know they get really emotional blind on blind these recreational players. They hate it, um, and uh, it's amazing how often that happens. It's like they just take a stand blind on blind. They just dislike it. Um, I probably. Ooh, that's a pretty close one. That's a pretty close one, bottom right. I think 3x against the 3x. Wow, I, I don't, I don't want to even say what's what I'm gonna do there because I, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I have no idea. Uh, I think I'm just gonna bet smallish here because we get leverage. Uh, but uh, I'm not liking it. But it doesn't have to work very often to be profitable. He hasn't jammed on his pre, which he probably does with Jack Queen, King Queen, Ace Ten, Ace Queen, and A Six. So the fact that he hasn't jammed pre, he could be trapping a small percentage of the time. Not going to be that happening that often. Uh, more than that, he's probably got Queen Eight, Queen Nine, Nine Ten, uh, Jack Eight of Spades. But in any case, we're folding. You know, the, the stack depth that that player had, uh, that's annoying. Stack player that, the stack depth that player had from, you know, blind on blind was M7-ish, right? So they're going to be jamming on our raise there a lot. Uh, and I mean, I actually raised hoping they would, because I was obviously going to snap call with the ace nine. Uh, and this, I think, comes back to a hand that I played just before, uh, when I was talking about, uh, the seven eight off. Uh, that was, I hope this was, I presume that was this part. I'm probably going to, you know, cut this part up into, uh, two slices. I'm going to slice it down the middle. Uh, and so the 7 8 suited uh, offsuit before we said we needed, we had an effective M7 stack we were up against, and uh, 7 8 off had a PN of 10. And so I opted to sort of take that more aggressive line, just shove it in on that, that player. And one of the reasons why I you know, did that is because I didn't want to raise and get called and then get in tough spots out of position post flop. Uh, and potentially create sort of negative implied odds and allow my opponent to play correctly. Uh, and now you see an instance where uh, that actually happened. You know, we actually did just raise with the hand that, uh, you know, was strong, hoping to get jammed on, uh, and the player didn't jam on us. And uh, that made us quite sad, because we had the Queen 10 6 flop with Ace-9, and that's never a good flop to have with Ace-9, uh, especially out of position, and then we got abused. And sometimes that happens, you know, sometimes you abuse them, sometimes they abuse you, and we got abused. Uh, I think the ace-10 suited, you know, uh, this is our loose friend, so I actually just decided to flat here because I think we keep in a lot of hands that we do really well against, like all the smaller aces and tens. Uh, but, you know, you could go either way, you could you could certainly 3-bet it for value against this loose, loose cuddle Fodner. Uh, but I decided to play it a little bit small ballish here, uh, just because it's almost, I think, too powerful to 3-bet. You know, if we 3-bet any 4-bets, we probably have to fold. We did 3-betting before. Uh, at the same time, if he calls, you know, uh, yeah, we can fire C-bets, and it's not a bad hand. But at the same time, you know, I think just calling and keeping in a lot of hands we dominate is also a fine way to play this hand. And, and bottom left, I'm really just trying hard to just, 
look like we've given up and distracted by other tables and we're going to fold a few bets and try and sort of bluff catch here, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Bottom left, it looks like he's just defended a small blind with like sevens and that's it, he's giving up. So I think I will fold bottom middle now, uh, just on that board texture. We do have the third best pair in a gut shot, uh, but at the same time, you know, I called flop thinking occasionally we have the best hand, we have the gut shot to the nuts. Uh, so bottom left now, what am I going to do here? Is there any value? I'm just going to keep it simple. We probably could have got that hand to call. You know, I was going through my mind is maybe we can over pot river and make it look like we just decided we had the bluff, but I don't think that's probably going to work. Um, yeah, I mean, we could have just bet small. Our hand is face up, and any time you have a face up hand, you've got to be a little bit concerned because players can play perfectly against you. And I think if we bet small river, it looks like we've got a queen or a hand like Jack's, maybe just trying to get thin value. Uh, and therefore, he can call with the correct range against that hand, or he can decide to, you know, to make a raise that, that that hand can't call. I mean, like if he just bomb check raised the river huge, I mean, we probably can't call with that sort of hand. Uh, if You know, he can still have had some slow played hands or backed into a flush or had pocket eights on the river and filled up. Uh, obviously, it's a very small part of his range, so it's very dicey for him to make that play. Uh, but at the same time, you imagine if you do bet the river like quarter pot there and you just check raises huge. I mean, we're in pretty gross spot. Having said that, it's going to happen very, very rarely. Uh, and so I think the most straightforward play and obvious play is just to go ahead and bet for value. And then if it happens, so be it. Having said that, I uh, kind of chickened out. Buck, 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 and uh, just, um, yeah, checked back. So, uh, minor slap on the wrist for that one. Uh, but uh, I think all in all, that level, yeah, not too bad. Pretty solid level. Uh, built up a couple of stacks and, um, yeah, had a couple of hands hold and, uh, yeah, just did some good old honest, you know, grinding. Um, so uh, we'll finish up there, guys, and be back with more action soon.